You are tuned into the Showbank Show live from Rated R Studios. We're coming off the hot episode with uh, Jabbar, and we're gonna give you guys another solid episode. I'm your boy Rated R Randy. I got my guy Papa Shoulder. I got Rowdy Ray. I got EDJ, and I got B on the motherfucking couch. Let's get into it. All right, we got a new segment of True or False this week, and we're gonna get right into it with uh, the NBA playoffs. Uh, first things first. James Harden and CP3's legacy took a hit with the loss uh, to the Warriors. I think it was six games, correct? Six yeah. games in the series, and they're done. True. CP3 and James Harden's legacies took a great hit. CP3, it took a hit, but ultimately, I think he underachieved enough throughout his career to where it wasn't as big of a hit as James Harden. With James Harden, you're talking about somebody that could have launched himself with the title this year, he could have launched himself in the conversation for being better than Dwayne Wade. Even though I wouldn't have believed it, I wouldn't have ag- agreed to it, but his statistics are ultimately going to pass D. Wade's. And if he would have won a title, he would have spearheaded a championship. Um, he would have won a title while spearheading a championship, um, and D. Wade only spearheaded one of his championships. So I think he could have put himself in legendary talk, like true legendary talks. And he just failed to do that. And with that, it takes an ultimate hit. Yeah, no, it, it's true. More so for Harden, like you said, than <clears throat> Ms. Paul. Um, I, I never really considered Chris Paul's legacy to be as big just because of who he had when he went to the Clippers um, and how he kind of, I mean, Clippers failed as a unit for sure. But I think he could have done more with that team, for sure. Uh, but yeah, James Harden really took a major hit. And I just I couldn't stand watching him play in that series anymore. I mean, I, I understand your strategy. I understand that you're looking for contact with the threes to make it a four-point play because you need every point you can possibly get against the Warriors, even without Kevin Durant, um, for sure. But just quit doing that. It's, it's, it's annoying. I mean, it's just annoying. You're an MVP caliber player, but you're trying to man, manipulate the rules, manipulate the game in general, just to get a cheap fourth point, and most of the time you missed him in that particular game, in game six, the game that mattered the most, without Kevin Durant on the court at all, and you can't make three of those? I mean, that's that's a huge hit to his legacy. And not that James Harden isn't a really good player, because he's very talented, and when he's not looking for contact, he's making shots and doing those step backs that are extremely impressive, and I don't think anyone in the league can really duplicate that well. But when you're looking for contact that hard, and when you're stretching and trying everything you can do and trying to stretch the rules, the whole Rockets team did that the whole series, and it was super annoying to watch. But if you're trying to do that, that's going to hurt your legacy big time just because it looks like you're that desperate to beat a team that's clearly 50 times better than yours, which, I mean, they're better than anybody. But to be better than your team and then look that desperate to beat them, I think that hurts your legacy tremendously. I think I would say true, too. I think with CP3, like you guys are saying, I think it more uh, solidifies what his legacy is than anything. But, yeah, with James Harden, I think that it's, uh, especially without Kevin Durant, as you mentioned, I think that it's a it's a little bit of a hit on Harden, and especially like Randy was saying with with the season that he had, and if he could have pulled off a championship, like it would have been a very special season. And you know now it's just kind of a well, I mean you killed it in the regular season, but I mean what are you, what are you doing for me? Like I mean legacies are heavily based on championships. I think almost no matter the sport besides baseball, really. I mean yeah, but. Anywhere else, I mean, basketball-wise, football-wise, you know, you're looking at how many rings you got, you know. You haven't won a ring. Are you really a Hall of Famer, you know, type of thing? I mean, obviously, I mean, I I don't know for sure about Harden uh, at this point. I I mean, is he seen as probably going to be a future Hall of Famer? Oh, yeah, he'll be first ballot. He'll be first ballot Hall of Famer. So, at, at the same time, but, you know, you can be a Hall of Famer, but are you... You know, there, there's another, you know, bubble to break into. But he's not being, Jordan, he's exactly. not Kobe, and he's not D-Wade. As of right now, he's right. just not. And I think he fucked himself out of an MVP trophy. Mm-hmm. I think that's Giannis. That's, that's well, as good as Giannis is right I mean, now. Yeah, he he lost his MVP trophy for sure, but I mean... Especially it, with what the Bucks did with the Celtics. Right, and so. I mean, it, it, I, Giannis basically made the point for himself to be MVP in this 
playoff series. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, Giannis played himself into it if he didn't have it, and Harden easily played himself out to it. But I think, you know, looking into this playoff thing now, I think Harden would have had to play his best just to keep up with Giannis in the MVP race at that point. Because, I mean, the Bucks don't have Giannis. The Bucks aren't anything, really. I, mean, I don't think they are. So, I mean, and the way Giannis has played has just been spectacular. So, um, yeah, the MVPs now Giannis is for sure. I would be shocked if they gave it to Harden. And I think Harden, you know, just like Randy said last night when we were all talking, I mean, he struggled in the playoffs again when it matters. I'll, I'll say true. So we got a unanimous <laughs> true across the board. All right. So moving on to the next one, we got uh, a little bit of a boxing. The bare knuckle boxing should be outlawed. Um, I don't know if everyone's seen the uh, Artem Lobo versus Jason Knight. Knight, okay. Yeah, um, after seeing the pictures and whatnot and what these men did to each other in that ring, um, not to mention... Was it that same card that they pulled the... But they said they were going to take some of somebody's purse? Yeah, they said they were going to take 50% of somebody's 50%, purse. 50%, yeah. But... They uh, didn't. They didn't. Right. But it was just all a gimmick, you know? Right. And, you know, I don't know. That's kind of... I think, it, especially in America, like, we do not like shit like that because we want... Um, you know, that plays into more of, like, pro wrestling type things exactly. and we want pro wrestling as far away from our MMA as we can yeah from real fighting exactly so I think that I'm gonna go ahead and say false on this I don't think that it should necessarily be outlawed but at the same time like I don't know after seeing what those two men like the damage that they took in that fight I mean they took years off each other's lives but like for sure I mean you like if you saw those pictures they were gruesome mm -hmm. like i'm pretty sure instagram at one point like flagged one of them as graphic content that i had to click okay to see yeah. so i mean I'm, I'm gonna say true and just simply because i mean barrel knuckle fights are for like fights at school yeah. i mean you don't get two trained boxers to take the gloves off and hit each other as hard as they can in the face professionally i mean <laughs> what is wrong with you why why are you paying these men to do that to each other and you're basically watching yeah you're, well they, and look at the guys that are in there yeah almost all of the guys that chris lieben um artem lobo uh jason knight like guys, guys the like that careers. that well one are at the end of their careers i mean lieben's been retired for years but i mean the consensus i think with most of these guys are the guys that they just want to fight. They don't give a fuck what happens to them. They just want to go out there and they want to fight. Like a Diego Sanchez would be perfect for this, you know, bare knuckle. Well, that's uh, great. Go go pick a bar fight some night. I mean, just don't. But then they can get in trouble legally. That well, way. they can they can do it. But the debate on this is, way. you know, it shouldn't be sanctioned anyway. No. So it should. It should as long as there's a apt uh, medical staff on hand and. When, these are consenting adults because, like you said, oh, go pick a bar fight. At that point, it's not regulated. Somebody could die. Motherfuckers might die. You can die from this. Yeah, but guess what? They signed up to die. Two guys signed up to die for this. Didn't nobody sign to die up in a bar fight. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? So this makes more sense to me. I definitely think it should be outlawed. Uh, I can go with uh, true just because it's barbaric, primitive. Uh, I think it's something that you do. At the beginning of time when you cannot make boxing gloves or UFC mm -hmm. gloves. I think that's something that you do. Or you're just on the schoolyard, like EDJ said, and you're fighting and stuff like that. But to just have a career of bare-knuckle fighting when we know the effects of CTE and different head traumas and things of that nature, it's stupid. It's very stupid to have a bare-knuckle league. I mean, all of, these, all of these fighting leagues are dangerous, obviously. But to bare-knuckle, bro... Bare knuckles, dog. I think, though, with the CTE thing, I don't think that that factors too much because either way, boxing-wise or MMA-wise, you're still going to take that same damage. And I think this is more of a, like... It just makes you look worse. A yeah. That's the only yeah. difference. That is literally the because only difference. Because, honestly... Is that, is, that, is, that, is that factually based or what? Not, it, not it, necessarily, it, no. I mean, I'm just saying, in theory, it would seem like... Okay, you have less ounces of gloves protecting your hands. It's bare knuckles. I would think the impacts would be harder. But also, if that knocks you out, 
you know, like CTA, CTE is not built from being knocked out. It's built from repetitive hitting. That is That's repetitive why, hitting. No, no, no. I, no, I totally agree with you. Uh, but, you know, like, like at the end of the day, like MMA is a much safer sport than boxing. It is just so much safer when you think about head trauma wise, because in boxing, you know, it's more repetitive. Right, to, right. To the Compared to, you know, say you get dropped in an MMA fight, you get hit two more times, this fight's over. In boxing, you could get dropped and you have 10 seconds to get up. You may have just gotten knocked the fuck out, but now you're boxing for six more rounds and, Case you know, point, may Tyson take... Fury. That man was out exactly for eight seconds, somehow woke up within those last two and got up. Yeah. He shouldn't have been able to continue, to be completely honest. But... S- what makes it so much worse that they're bare knuckle boxing? That's what I want to know. The, the graphicness of it. And we saw it with the Jason Knight and Artem Lobo fight. And when it comes to that, I think it... Like I said, I, I don't think it should necessarily be outlawed because, like Ray was saying, it's two consenting adults that, you know, if they want to go in there and bare knuckle fight, I mean, fuck it. Let them go in there and bare, bare knuckle, knuckle fight, fight because that's what they signed up for. I mean, we let... Motherfuckers go out and smash each other on Sundays every week. You know? Not the same thing. Mm. Not the same thing. What's the difference? You're still taking head trauma. You're taking head trauma, but there's a difference between bare knuckles. I think at the end of the day, it's just the graphicness of it. I, I think that's it's... All I'm, I'm, I, and I get that maybe for you guys, but I'm saying for me, it's not. I'm saying there's... To me, is a difference with bare knuckles, though. Like, I think that's... And I agree with you because... And that's definitely... Uh, you know, very, just the look of it, you know, there's no gloves, that's, that's going to seem very barbaric, I mean, that was, like, the UFC also, was promoted off that shit well, in the I beginning. Say, uh, like, do you, do you know, like, how it's done, like, just, like, not even trying to crack jokes or nothing, or, like, be condescending, like, they, it's not just actual, just straight up knuckles, like, they're wrapping their hands, and there's slight padding, like, very slight padding, right there, just on the knuckles to pad them, just to protect the hands, other than that, it's it's literally no different from boxing to me. So essentially, it's still virtually little padding. Little padding, minimal padding. Like maybe, maybe like a half ounce. Like when you get your hands wrapped to be put in a boxing <laughs> glove, that's where it is. That's you've got is. you've got gauze padding. Yeah. That's what you've got yeah, at, that's why at I said the like end of the day. Ounce. If that, you that's know. murder, man. How? I mean, I think you break noses easier that way. I think you break eye sockets easier that way. I mean, it's it's it's. It's more I think I think it's more going to be more broken hands than more yeah, well, broken yeah, bones. Hands and, that's all you're gonna yeah. see. and then think about that, too, is just, I mean, how hard are you really going to, you know, unless you know you got a clean shot, how hard are you going to hit that man? If you know I'm going to break my hand on the top of his head Why and fuck me up for the rest of the fight. Rather than it's it's kind of a, a give and take, I think, because mm-hmm. I'm kind of on both sides of it. After seeing the Lobo and night fight it, it's tough to see that shit but at the same time i don't know so we all me and ray got 50, 50. yeah yeah half a half mm-hmm. all right so moving on to the nfl draft for the rest of this segment first things first pick number six <laughs> daniel jones <laughs> Spread. Daniel <laughs> Jones is the worst pick in the 2019 NFL draft. Is, is he the 2019 or ever? Oh shit! Damn. <laughs> well, that's yet to be seen. That is at yet this to point, be seen. I would say that's that, that, that's a little disrespectful. But Jamarcus Russell. Yeah. <laughs> it's still Jamarcus Russell. Yeah. But you're you're talking about a you're talking about a guy that's like the fourth best quarterback on every single buddy's person's list. I mean, he wasn't even considered. He was considered like a maybe the thirty-second pick, if that, um, in the first round because they figured the other three quarterbacks would be gone in Murray, Haskins, and Locke, uh, way before then. So, to take him sixth overall when you still had Haskins on the board, who was considered better than Jones, that's crazy to me that you would even if you didn't want to take Haskins you wanted to get an elite defensive player right you could have gotten it with that six pick right and he would have been there at 17 and who did they end up taking later because they had another pick DeAndre Baker quarterback from uh, Georgia who and that's a good pick yeah no DeAndre Baker is a good player because look they could have had Josh Allen Ed Oliver 
Devin Bush. Like they were, like the list just goes on. The list goes on. They could have had who? Rashawn Gary, Christian Wilkins, just a, a, a plethora of elite defensive players, you know, to help replace uh, the loss of uh, Olivier Vernon and Snacks Harrison. Mm-hmm. But no, they and they they've made it clear that they want to stick by Eli for at least another year or two. I think the best thing is the fucking fan reaction. Oh, that was yeah, Man, <laughs> if you watch the fan reaction from MetLife, all of them are just like, what? <laughs> what? I mean, it, it would have it made more sense for them to just draft a wide receiver at that point. It would have made I mean, more sense to just trade down. And Why that too. not just trade that out? Too. If you know Daniel Jones is going to be there later, no one's looking at him. Just trade down. You could have got so much more value, and then you still have that same pick that they got Baker with. Why not just trade down? Very simple. They could have traded that shit to the Redskins. They would have drafted Haskins there. Mm -hmm. And instead, they just let them get Haskins, and they pick Jones. I mean, I don't know. Right there, I I remember uh, messaging either. It was either just Randy or the group chat saying uh, that, wow, and then the Redskins got Haskins. So (laughs) now... If Daniel now, Jones doesn't work out and Haskins is a great quarterback, you have to see him twice a year. You got to play him twice a year now. Like, how stupid do you look? <laughs> like, that is like ultimate level fuck up. I uh, mean, like, this is the worst part. I don't understand what's the end game for Gettleman. None of, the, none of it makes Getting any fired? Sense. That's it. I think he just wants to wreck this organization and leave. That's it. Because the fact that you've traded away two key pieces of that team, you know, on offense and defense, you know, with Odell Beckham and Olivier Vernon, and then you go and you draft Daniel Jones, number six overall. Why? Why? At this point, they could have just tanked this next year and went for Tua. Yeah, I wouldn't go for Tua. I mean, I'm just saying, like, a more surefire guy yeah. than Daniel Jones. I mean, at this Shit, point... They had two guys on the board that were more surefire than Daniel Jones, so... Yeah. I mean, at this point, if I'm the Giants, I have a two-year plan of taking for Trevor Lawrence. And at this point, I mean, Trevor Lawrence is probably one of the best college prospects coming out of college since Andrew Luck. I mean, Trevor Lawrence is that good. So, I mean, if I think we're going to see some teams that are terrible this year, and we're going to see a lot of teams be horrendous uh, next year for sure because they're going to want that guy. So, I don't know, yeah, but that um, that's probably the worst pick of the draft. It's probably it's the worst true. pick I've ever seen. Yeah, so we've all <laughs> got a true. unanimous yeah. hard true. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the all of these uh, true or falses are all quarterback based right now, and the next one is Drew Lock is the final solution in Denver. This is who they have uh, their final move to complete their plan of coming up second to the Chiefs in the AFC West. False. I don't think. From what I gather from little highlights I watched and things I've heard from uh, Mizzou fans, Drew Locke is an exceptional quarterback. I just don't think he's going to be the answer at the NFL level. I think he'll be probably a good quality backup. True. That's disrespectful. Note that you said from little that you've watched of Drew Locke. Little. I mean, he's just, he's just got a lot of talent. It's, he was se- He's second all-time SEC in passing yards. So everything you've got in a mold of just a strictly quarterback. I said this, you know, I've said this multiple times. Strictly quarterback mold, Drew Locke was the best quarterback. Now, if we're talking about best athlete and quarterback, no, he wasn't. But best overall quarterback in general, I would say it was to him. I think he has the luxury of sitting for a year or two. Joe Flacco probably isn't the best to learn from, but arm-wise, probably. But other, outside of that, I don't I really consider Drew, Joe Flacco rather a good uh, learning tree like Patrick Mahomes had with Alex <coughs> Smith. That's probably the best situation for Patrick Mahomes ever being ever. Um, so for that case, I, I think Drew Locke can be a... Mid of the middle of the pack starting quarterback is either a final solution, no, but is he a solution for the next five to six years, maybe seven or eight? Yeah, I mean, I agree with that. I think that he can come in and you know be relatively decent, and you know, like you said, having that uh time to sit sit behind Flacco, um, I think benefits you know, majority of quarterbacks when they can come in the league and sit behind at least a year or two. And just kind of get a hold of what system they're going to be running um, coming up. And so I think that he can be, you know, a, a relatively good quarterback. But, I mean, if they can keep doing what they're doing defensively and, you know, they, I think that they drafted pretty well on that side of the ball, 
And, you know, obviously they've got a great defense. With that mold, you don't have to be the best quarterback in the world. And no. if they can continue to run how they have, and, I mean, it seems like as, as long as I can remember, Denver is always pumping out some random running back this season that's just McGain. tearing it up. Exactly. Yeah. You know, you can name out Ruben Drone. Mm-hmm. Um, what they had Terrell Davis in the 90s. They had, you know, all kinds of guys that just Philip Lindsay that popped up out of nowhere last year. You know, they seem to be able to put it together running-wise and – that's a championship mold. If you can run the football and have a defense that can stop the ball, I mean, you can, because, I mean, they for damn sure didn't win a Super Bowl with Peyton Manning. Sure. You know what I'm saying? Like, that was not the same Peyton Manning that we have seen before. That was a washed up man. Exactly. Sure. I mean, so, not yeah. to mention that, you know, he didn't play half that season for mm-hmm. a reason. Like, so I think that he can come in and be what they need him to be. So I say true. I think that he can be the final solution yeah. in Denver, and I think that's what they're playing for. That you know they're they're trying to play chess right now, and we'll see how it works. Yeah, now nah, I'm gonna go with uh, true. I think he is uh, for the foreseeable future the franchise quarterback. Yeah, you know he's shown skills, and he, it's not like a lot's gonna be asked of him immediately. You know what I mean? He's sitting behind a guy that uh, what, what's the GM's name again? Help me out, uh, Elway. My bad. Elway, you know, it's one of his guys. You know, he likes he likes Flacco. And then Flacco, he has a safe style that's going to keep them in contention. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So, and then he'll get some postseason, because I, I imagine them making uh, at least a wild card spot. Over L.A., though? Over the Chargers? Mm. But, I mean, uh, there can be two wild card spots coming out of the same yeah, division. Yeah, I, so. I just, I think they're With all the competition in the AFC like a this ra- year, like the AFC is really so good. Could get in the, the second wild card. Somewhere well, like I mean, that. and look at that whole division in the north. I mean, you kind of got the same situation where those top the three Steelers, teams may be yeah. really good. The Steelers, Browns, Ravens. And you look at the east, I mean, you've got, uh, obviously, the Patriots. Uh, the Giants, or not the Giants, the Jets, excuse me. The could Jets, be, they're looking fun. Uh, uh, the, the even the Dolphins. Uh, I mean, not the Dolphins, nah, but the Bills won't year. go away. It, the Bills won't go away, but I mean, I don't see why the Dolphins can't have a surprise season. I mean, they could come out of nowhere and have a, a decent season, I think, and be one of those teams that, like, just happens to get in because everybody else is so good and everybody's beating each other up. I think and, six and ten is their ceiling. Well, what what did they place last year? Were they the number two team in the East? Last year? Yeah. Miami? No. No, they were the last team in the East. Yeah. So they're gonna they're gonna have an easier schedule. That's true. So Well, to be fair, the Chiefs have like one of the easiest schedules in football and they went to the AFC Championship game. Yeah. yeah. I think it's like twenty ninth. Which is crazy. That the Chiefs have this mm-hmm. year? Twenty ninth. I mean, that's great for us. Exactly. <laughs> I'll, I'll take it right now, especially everything going on. Yeah. We'll, we'll take an easy schedule, but uh So what? So I don't know. There's just a lot of competition in the AFC, and cause and then the South, you've got the the Man. Texans. You've got uh, the Jaguars should go at least ten and six, very least. I don't have a lot of trust in the Texans. Really? I, I just really? Because I have a lot less trust in the Jags than I do the Texans. Well, no, really? yeah, no, really, yeah, offensively, Foles. yeah, Foles outside of Philly is ass. This trash. I feel like what Doug Maroney is going to do is going to be conducive to success for him. Because he's not going to ask him to pass the ball much. He's going to literally ask him to dump it off and hand off the ball. That is it. That's true. That's true. I mean, and, and, and which which with an elite hate? defense, they should go ten and six minimum. Okay, I feel you on that because it's the same thing. Like we're talking about Denver. That's the mold: defense and a running okay. game. And your quarterback ain't got to do much. So, um, I think on this one, what me and you got true, right? True. Yeah. yeah, three uh, true, three three true, three true, uh, one false. The yeah, lone false. All right, and for our last bit of true or false, we have Kyler Murray will be the best quarterback of the 2019 NFL draft. I'll say false. Um, I don't think he'll be the worst quarterback in the draft. I mean, that's Daniel Jones. but Or Will Gear, I don't know, or Ryan Finley. I don't know, one of those guys. But overall, or Jared Stidden from the Patriots. Hey guys. Um, oh, he's hey just guys. he's just okay. He was okay at Auburn. He wasn't great, but um, no, I, I can't see him being the best. I think he'll be towards the top. I think he'll be top three. But to call him the best, I don't know. I I I, I can't call any of these guys the best. I, I don't think any of them are strictly way better than the other. Um, I think they all have different skill sets, 
for sure. But um, <laughs> who do you I think is in the best situation then? The best situation? None of them really. But I mean, if you want just starting situation, probably Askins. But that's a stretch. Um, but Stenham, I guess, because he's sitting behind Tom Brady, and it's really the only the best situation you could ever have. So I would say false just on that province, but I don't think he'll be a bad quarterback. Well, he'll be okay. I'm going to actually go with true, and but it comes with conditions. I think he's going to be the best quarterback of the 2019 draft this next season. I think ultimately his mobility will save him in pressure situations where his line can't hold through. Um, but I ultimately think Haskins will end up being the best quarterback of this draft. I, th- I just I – just, with the eye test, and I know that's very subjective, but I just see him being the best quarterback in the draft. I don't really think it's too close. I, th- I just think he has next-level touch on his secondary, uh, his passes in the secondary. Yeah, I'm going to go with Haskins, but I definitely see Kyler Murray being the best quarterback out of the draft for the upcoming season. Uh, I'm going to go true, just for the simple fact I feel like he's going to have the right amount of time to develop. He has the coach who's going to help develop him. They're trying to put some, you know, talent around him and offensively. He has, you know, a a Pro Bowl worthy running back that he can dump off to in, you know, bad situations. Christian Kirk should be taking another step forward. Ricky Seals Jones looks like a good tight end prospect. I feel like uh, as long as they build a good uh secondary not secondary, excuse me, uh offensive line around him and shore up that defense, I think he'll be in a very successful position. I feel like though that's been the problem for a while, right? Uh, with the offensive line. So I don't know. I don't know how much better that offensive line is really gonna get, or you know, do they not have an eye for talent on the offensive line, or you know, some something. You know, what is the real problem? Because I feel like they've been on this problem for a while. We know they can put together a defense. They've had a, a really good defense uh, before, but <clears throat> I don't know. I'm kind of on the fence on this because honestly. I'd like both Haskins and Drew Locke's spot where they're at at the moment. So I'm going to say false just for the simple fact that, you know, I think both of them could have an opportunity to be better than him. But if they, if they can get the ball rolling in Arizona, I mean, there is a possibility that Kyler Murray could be a, uh, you know, just different quarterback in the mm-hmm. league for real. And... I don't know, though. I think it also goes with how you judge judge a quarterback's success because I think that he'll get a lot more done with his legs than he will actually throwing the ball. The worst part is is that I actually wanted to pick Haskins. It's just his offensive situation is garbage. It is a wasteland up there. They wasted mm-hmm. a first-round pick on Josh Doxson. Jamison Crowder is gone. Uh, Jordan Reed isn't what isn't the tight end that everybody thought he would be. Mm. Vernon Davis is Old. a geriatric at this point. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> There's nothing there besides a good run game. And to just reduce him to a dink and dunk quarterback is an insult to Dwayne Haskins skills. Yeah. Yeah, I mean I I feel that. So we're bringing you a new segment here on the Showbank Show called Showbank's Holds Court. And basically what it is is just kind of a bring to the table. See what you got and see what's on your mind, been on your mind the whole week. And uh, just kind of give it 10, 15 minutes. We're all going to kind of debate it and see what's going on. Uh, I know I'm about to give Randy a stroke here in about two seconds. But we're going to go ahead and get into it, Showbank's Hold Court. All right, so I've got something that uh, came to mind when we were talking about doing this segment uh, from the get-go. And I want to talk about something that's happened fairly recently and the L.A. Lakers and just their complete downfall um, and a sense of ownership and just in general. How do you let a franchise fall so far that you have your fans standing out in front of the Staples Center and doing a little, I don't know what they would call it, a protest of some sort? Um, You're just straight up negligent to your fan base. And I know a lot of people thought that bringing in LeBron James was a great idea. We'll get into that here in a second. But at the end of the day, look at LeBron James is what he's brought to your team. Look what he's brought to the franchise. It's absolutely nothing like you, what you thought it was going to be in any way, shape, or form. And then they don't assign Ty Lue to a deal. Um, 
they get rid of Luke Walton, who I think is actually a really good coach. I just think it didn't work with LeBron James. I mean, and Randy, I see that look. Hold on, we'll get there in a second. But look at what Luke Walton did with the Warriors. I know the Warriors are on a different level, but I mean, you can't deny that he wasn't the coach at the time. If you can't coach a team, then they're not going to win that many games. You can go ahead and answer. It's okay. What, what, uh, what, what did Luke Walton coach the Warriors? Like, what? What did what did he coach the Warriors? Wasn't he an assistant coach? Yeah, he was assistant coach. But when Steph, uh, Steve Kerr rather, was out during whatever, whatever happened to him, he was the head coach, and they went on that winning streak. I forget how many it was. They went on a winning streak. Okay, yeah. and it was like the legendary winning streak, right? It was yeah. like one of the best winning. And who was on their team? It doesn't matter who's on your team. I just, I just, I, no, I'm just no, asking I, questions. I know who's on the Steph team. Curry we don't need to go team. over the roster. We know Clay who's on the team. team. We know so who's on the team. So that being said. You could go coach that team, and they still could have went on that winning streak. Not necessarily. They would have still won games. They would have still been uber competitive. They still would have won games. They still would have been uber competitive no matter who's at the helm of that coaching position. Mm. He did nothing. But at the same time, would they have went on the winning streak that they did without the? Is that relative? I I think it is because, I, I mean, think, they yeah, haven't done that with Steve a Kerr. 50, like 50-plus 50 one team, right? Yeah, okay. No, I I agree with both of your points because uh, they're still going to win games. They're still going to be, you know, the best team. But at the same time, did he spark, you know, the the winning streak necessarily and maybe, you know, tweaked a couple things that worked out in the long run? I mean... In my personal opinion, I don't think he did. Uh, you could argue that he did and you, you'd still have a very competitive argument. I don't think he did. I don't think he did much to improve the Warriors. That was already the best team in the league when he stepped in. Wait. So I don't think I think you you put him into a situ or bring him to a situation uh, like the Lakers, and you really see what kind of coach he is. And I think we've seen what kind of coach he is. I think mm. I think that's fair. But well, what do you think about Steve Kerr? I think he's a good Steve Kerr is under the Popovich coaching umbrella. He's a he's a good coach, but back to back to EDJ's point. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, go ahead, because I don't want to get off topic of, of what you're All right. talking about. So basically, what we're going to get back to is well, obviously the genie bus is off water job. I mean, and then you let go of Magic Johnson. Uh, he leaves, so I think I guess he leave left. He didn't. They didn't. Whatever. Whatever. The mutual agreement. Blah blah blah. It's just a mess. And for you to come out and get LeBron James like you did, sign him to that deal and then have him do nothing, and then demand that you trade the players that you drafted to get Anthony Davis, how is that going to work? How does that work? How are you going to get LeBron James and Anthony Davis, A, to play well together, B, get them to a championship level, and C, even get them to the playoffs at that point? So is this about LeBron James or is it about the Lakers mess? Well, it's it's a bad move because by the Lakers to begin with. What, what about LeBron James in this situation brings about the Lakers' downfall? I don't see it. Because he chased out Luke Walton. Shocker, he chased out another coach. Um, he wanted half of the players that they drafted to be traded. To Did get Luke Anthony Walton Davis. have success before LeBron came with the Lakers? How would, success? You have su how would you have success with a team that's not good? But you needed time. That's why you hire someone to develop a team that needed time to develop. The Lakers weren't playoff ready by Luke, when Luke Walton got there. When Luke Walton got there, excuse me. Would you agree with that? But I... But I I guess what I'm trying to say is what measures do you have or what what factors are you trying to say that prove LeBron chased Luke Walton out of um, LA? I think that like I like I like what EDG said EDJ said right there just because I think that like they should have they should have given Luke Walton time to grow with the team because you've got a coach, a young coach that needs to develop just with a team that's young and needs to develop. And I think the problem there of going out and getting LeBron James is that's it, it's not uh, conducive for a team that needs to grow. And exactly. You answered it. So this is all on the Lakers brass because if you want a coach to really grow with that team and that roster over time, you don't sign somebody in their 16th year. Exactly. That's, that's in win now mode. Well, you know what I'm saying? I, I I agree and disagree with you. You don't sign LeBron James. You could sign somebody else. You can't can sign. You can't. No, no, no. Just just hear me out with this because one, it's way too much money. But two, I mean, think about a guy that's in his 16th season. That's 
I, I see what you're saying with the win now attitude because you I think you do need a little bit of that uh you know, a guy that's been to the playoffs, a guy that knows what winning basketball is about and help these young players develop. And I I agree with what you said because LeBron is not in a well, I'm ready to help some people grow. I'm I want more rings. So it again, like you said, it, it comes down to the Lakers. LeBron is not conducive for this situation. But it does come down to the Lakers, and they made the call to go out and sign LeBron. But at the end of the day, he's the one that signed the contract. Yeah, but I mean, that's not on him. That's I mean, would you not sign the contract? Why not? It's L.A. It's I think I think he signed it because he thought he could do whatever he wanted. And he can. He's LeBron James. I know, but anyway, I mean, which is dumb. I mean, so is it is your is your grief with the Lakers brass or is it with LeBron? It's with both. Who's who? Who do you think is more at fault, EDJ? Team wise, I would probably say the buses, but as a <clears throat> overall and as the glue molding together, it's LeBron. Because I mean, you can't just you can't. He, you've seen him do it before. You know what this guy does. He comes well, into your that's franchise. Exactly why they shouldn't assign exactly. him? Exactly. He comes into your franchise and he demands that you get players of his caliber randomly, or he'll go to a team that he sees that actually has talent. Cleveland twice. Or once, actually, because he went back to Cleveland. That was his, you know, when they got talent. So he only goes to places where he sees talent or where he thinks he can control the entire scenario. And he thought he could do it in L.A., and that fell on his face, and it's hilarious to watch. And it really hurts his reputation, I think, in the long run. So if we already have the sample size that he wants to do whatever the hell he wants to do, it, to me, all fault falls on the buses for signing this, you know, quote-unquote cancer, Right. That's yeah. their fault. It's not his fault for signing it and doing what he wants to do. He knows what he's going to do. There's going to be teams that's going to let him do whatever the hell he wants to do, and it's their fault for signing him. Right or wrong? Also, it wasn't his fault that that uh, Magic chose to draft Lonzo Ball instead of De'Aaron Fox or Jason Tatum. It also wasn't LeBron's fault that they brought in Rondo, uh, Lance Stevenson, JaVale, JaVale McGee. McGee. Like, that's not his <laughs> fault. That is the Lakers' brand no, fault. No, yeah, exactly. But I'm not. I, as you heard, I'm not putting it all on him. But, but you said overall, LeBron James is more accountable he than is the brass. Overall, accountable because of who he is. He's accountable because of who he is. He took the Cleveland Cavaliers, who had absolutely nothing at the beginning of his career. We're talking about in the beginning of his career, not the LeBron James we know now, not the LeBron mm-hmm. James that has multiple MVPs, three championship rings. I mean, three very cheap championship rings, but three championship rings nonetheless. Oh. And nonetheless, I mean, this guy is the polarized figure of basketball, right? Okay. Yeah. You don't talk about the NBA if you don't talk about LeBron James. Right. I'm with you. So the point being is that LeBron James is the reason that the Lakers are in this mess at the end of the day. Because the bus has signed him. It is the bus's fault for signing him. But you... The buses have made more terrible moves than LeBron made. Facts. Awesome. And the only reason LeBron is in play is because of the buses. That's the only reason LeBron gets to go there and make said bad decisions that you claim he made is because the buses chose to sign him. Magic chose to sign him, which Magic is somebody that the buses put in charge. But that's a whole nother story for a whole nother day. Also, not to mention that this is the same organization that gave a beyond past prime Kobe a massive contract that they had to sit with and eat for years just out of loyalty, quote unquote, instead of doing what they should have done and, you know, let them either go, sign them to a veteran minimum, something to that effect, and start planning for the future. Well, I mean, there's a lot of franchises that do that. Um, I mean, if we're talking about just any sport in general, I mean, look at the baseball, look at the Royals did with Alex Gordon. Oh, no, I this mean, is all facts, but we're talking about the Lakers. And no, yeah. their shortcomings. So this this was really just a, a, a cumulative fuck up on their part. That's big that, facts. That just came to That's a big facts. as soon as LeBron got there. It's just exacerbated by the name of LeBron James. That is all. Mm, they tried to throw a mandate on it with LeBron. I, I think. Like, all, all I'm saying is LeBron is looking real Obama ish right now. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, shit. Okay, well, I mean, before everyone acts like I don't know what I'm talking about, I'm just going to end on this point. LeBron James 
in history will be in the top three. That really hurt my soul, but he'll be in the top three. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. He'll be in the top three, but you can't deny that the guy brings troubles to a franchise. Once and once he left Cleveland the first time, he brings trouble to franchises. That's a fact. And, I mean, th- that's why I think a lot of people like Michael Jordan more. I mean, I know he left the Bulls, but he went back to the Bulls and then won three more championships. If they allow players to have as much control as a guy like LeBron does now, back then Michael Jordan would have had that same control. He could have, but I think the league was way different then, though. Exactly. They weren't going to allow players to have that type right, of control. Right, exactly. So to move on from EDJ talking crazy, I want to talk about something else that people think is crazy. Uh, the decriminalization in the city of Denver of magic mushrooms, psilocybin, which is still a federal Schedule One drug, narcotic. Personally, I think this is a good step forward. So that way, once it becomes legalized, we can actually have official studies instead of just this hearsay. Uh, what y'all think? Uh, I think I agree with you. I mean, like, we need to be able to have those studies and whatnot. We'll see really what are the effects of of these things, you know, like mushrooms, marijuana, the, you know, like people, we don't know because we haven't had like real studies on it and whatnot. Right. So I think it's good and a good step forward, especially if it can help with, you know, whatever, whatever it may help with, you know? Yeah. Uh, and to kind of play devil's advocate to my own point, uh, there's a lot of people worried in Denver because, one, it passed on such a narrow margin, and number two, they already have legalized marijuana, and they feel like that's, you know, uh, bringing degradation into the city. And now that magic mushrooms won't be as heavily prosecuted, you know, as they once were, uh, they, they feel like this is, you know, leading to uh, society societal decay, essentially. Yeah, and I mean, I think that that's kind of a... I mean, it's a fair point because, I mean, you don't know, I mean, who may go out and do what not. You could go out and go to the dispensary and you just got to be 18 to go into the dispensary and buy. So, you know, you have mushrooms on top of that. I mean, who knows what the fuck you're about to do next. So what are the effects of magic mushrooms? Like what? Uh, the, some of the effects of magic mushrooms are uh, euphoria. Uh, possible paranoia, <clears throat> uh, maybe some nausea could be involved. Uh, hallucinations. Uh, yes, definitely hallucinations. Uh, and it, this is all, uh, it all varies on the amount taken. So what are the, are there any harsh risk factors? Yeah. Uh, uh, as with anything, you know, too much of it can lead to some uh, negative side effects. Like when I was talking about the nausea, uh, if you've eaten too many of them, they can cause you to vomit or, you know, things of that nature. But it's no death, like... Uh, as far as we've known, now, uh, if someone was to operate heavy machinery, like, you know, uh, a car or right. things of that nature while on magic mushrooms, yes, they put themselves at risk and others at harm, uh, you know, risk of harm. But not like a overdosage. Yes, as far as I've seen, there hasn't been uh, any cases of actual overdosing and dying from overdosing. Now, the worst part is, though, is that when people talk about overdosing, you know what people die from when they're overdosing. It's not actual the drug in their system. It's them choking on their own uh, vomit. Yeah, I think, and I mean, you you hear people all the time talk about, like, you know, bad trips and whatnot. So, I mean, who knows if, you know, to your point of devil's advocate, just, you know, who knows what someone might do operating anything, driving or whatnot. And especially if you, you know, you just went to the dispensary, picked you up, you know something to smoke and then who knows what what can go on from there so i mean i think it's i think it's good and bad but at the same time you can't just go pick up magic mushrooms anywhere because no. it's just decriminalized it's exactly. not like they're popping up shop you know everywhere and on this corner you can get your weed you can get your shrooms you can get a gun you can get right. you know what i mean you get liquor store you know so right. i mean it's not like it's uh yeah, it's just, I don't think it's too crazy, you know, with just the decriminalization because, I mean, at the end of the day, it grows up out of the ground, so, I mean... Ah, uh, here you go. I'm just saying. Yeah, man. It just grows out of the ground, man. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying it won't I, fuck you up. I'm just saying at the no, end of the day, I mean, it's not yeah. like, you know, you go to the liquor store and buy, you know, three cases of beer and five bottles and be fucked up, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I 
I don't care at this point. It really doesn't matter. I think it's basically kind of a distraction to worry about, to not worry about other things. Um, I think we've got bigger things to worry about than decriminalizing mushrooms. I mean, there's so much wrong with mental health these days that I, I think, you know, it's just being ignored to the point of no return. Um, so it just doesn't matter. I mean, I think they're going to find the, pretty much the same effect they find with marijuana and whatever they find, good for them. But at the end of the day, I, I just, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I don't think it does. I mean, I feel you on that. I, I think, like, I, I kind of feel you, but to go to your point of uh, mental health, like, that's very true. I mean, there's, I mean, at this point, whatever we can do for mental health, I think do it. Because, like, uh, a study that I was reading just a week or two ago, um, the world's depression, anger, and fearfulness rate is at an all-time high. That It's never been at, uh, I think it was 2017 and then even higher in 2018. So, I mean, mm. we have a serious problem, and, I mean, whatever we can do to try to fix it, I mean, if we... We find studies that mushrooms can help you beat some depression or something in, you know, whatever dosage it may be, then why not, you know, and different different strokes for different folks. And not to make this a total mental health conversation, but I think we contribute to our own downfall in regards to mental health. I think, you know, as popular as social media is, do people not think that that takes a toll on the use, mental health, just our, all our mental health. Like, I think that plays a big part. Social media and different things like that. Just the media, how things ought to be, as opposed to just doing your own thing. I think that plays a big part. So we could talk about magic mushrooms or weed or anything like that, but it's like we contribute to a lot of... It all boils down to self, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and very much so. And I think that almost it goes to just the culture we live in, too. Throw a Band-Aid on it. You know, don't worry about fixing the problem. We got a pill for that. We got right. this for that. We got whatever. You well, know? I, I like what Randy said. You know, it, now the social media is like culture shaping mm -hmm. more than anything. Mm -hmm. And, and um, to bounce off this point, and I know we're kind of going down a different road here, but it all ties down to the same thing. Um, you know, culture shaping is happened has happened in every generation and there's no ifs and or but about it uh, the culture has changed for generations and decades and whatever and even centuries um but i think one thing remains to be clear that at the end of the day it seems like most people generally most people can handle culture changing i think there's just a select few people um that culture changing or uh, social media or even, you know, to bounce off Randy's point, you know, social media bullying or whatever, cyberbullying or whatever you want to call it, um, takes a more leap of major affectingly a select few amount of people. And I think that's what we really need to focus on more so of decriminalizing drugs in general. I mean, not to go on a big anti-hippie rant because it's not what this is about. It's more of a rant of realizing the real problem in front of us. It's been staring us in the face for since the or mid nineties. Um, We've got a serious issue on our hands, but it's just being ignored, you know, and if whoever's out there and whoever has the ability to do something about it, please do it. Don't blame it on somebody. Don't blame it on the president. Don't blame it on a certain uh, governmental party. Don't blame it on the people that dislike you or hate you. It's all in the group that we work together and just do it because what you're seeing with these kids that are going around with the guns, it's not because they're angry. It's not because they have nothing to do with their lives. It's simply because they are not well. That's all it boils down to. And if until we recognize that as a whole, it just it won't work. I mean, I, I, I feel you on that point. I think that though you say, you know, anybody can help do it. I think it's up to all of us. I think it's every right. person, every individual, because you know, like, we don't, just like social media, uh, I think it was Joe Rogan podcast, and I want to say it was the Andrew Yang one I was watching, and it was, they were talking about mental health and whatnot, and, you know, you don't get the same endorphins from releasing into your body as, like, say, me and you are chatting on uh, Facebook Messenger or Snapchat or, you know, whatever the fuck you want to talk on nowadays, me, us sitting here in a room all having a conversation right now is releasing different endorphins than if we were all just in our group chat. And we think it's the same thing. And, and today, in today's day and age, you know, we, we automatically think that whether, you know, it's getting likes on, on my picture or, you know, getting retweets or, you know, whatever it may be, um, 
or followers, you don't get the same effect you do as just going out and like just being nice to people or, you know, opening the door for the next person that's coming behind you or, you know, you get different endorphins from actual human interaction than you're going to get from staring at your phone. And I think that is a huge problem and a huge a uh, plague on us as a society right now because we just think that it's all about social media and we're not, you know, I may have been in my room for, you know, 18 hours, you know, locked away, you know, like saying I'm a teenager, or a young person in the world today, and I think I'm having all kinds of social interactions, but really I'm just staring at a screen or a couple of screens playing the game with a couple of friends or, you know, talking to them on whatever, but I'm not actually having an experience because you know I'm not able to to feel the real you know what I'm supposed to feel and then comes depression you know and and that just slowly builds up and eats away at people and I think that you know like you said we've had a big problem for a long time and I think it's just going more towards the same problem and you know that fucks kids up in a big deal and you can't get away from bullying like you know, right. used to, you could go to school and get bullied all day long, but you come home, you get off that bus and you're at home. It's, you know, you have time to cope and really like, but now you got cyberbullying where you could be being attacked at 1245 a.m. on a school night and turn off the screen. Exactly. I mean, just turn it off. And like, you know, we shouldn't just be handing our kids this technology every left and right, like, and just letting them go to town, like, you know, and uh, do whatever the fuck they want. I'll say this in regards to the mental health aspect of it all, just to kind of draw this point to a close. Prevention is always better than treatment. Yes. Right? Yes. So if you start off, you know, teaching your child the ways of the world, and, and <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of times the health is the main thing, like actual physical health, because from studies I've been reading from uh, Dr. Rhonda Patrick, different gut bacteria and biomes within the body have a stronger connection to the brain than a lot of our synapses do. And the fact that the standard American diet is so terrible, I feel like that is a major part of, excuse me, a, a major contributor to mental health, uh, Poor mental health, should I say, amongst these children, because the gut bacteria is off. You know what I mean? Like the body isn't isn't right, isn't healthy. And that's something that a lot of people aren't educated on uh, diet wise. I mean, and and look at you know, just look at through the history of things and what people have been led to believe about diets. I mean, what the the sugar epidemic and whatnot, like sugar epidemic, dude. Like it's crazy to me that the food pyramid is the people scheme, like, right. Scheme. People really argued in the Supreme Court that breakfast cereal is just as nutritious as like bacon and eggs or you know whatever you want to eat you know to get like from a real meal. But sugary breakfast cereal is sugary as nutritious, processed sugar, like some frosted flakes or something. Like some that's flakes, ridiculous. Yeah. And that one in Supreme Court. I know. That's insane. All right, moving on from the uh, magic mushroom debate and kind of into more of a ethical debate and whatnot, uh, I thought this week we definitely need to touch on the Tyreek Hill situation and what's everyone's thoughts and what may come of Tyreek Hill uh, the next few weeks and months and uh, into the season. And will he play? Does he stay a chief? And kind of everybody's takes on that. Well, I mean, does he stay a chief? It depends on if Clark Hunt wants to keep him or not. I think we've seen a lot of Clark Hunt going back and forth on uh, past abusers and things of that nature. Um, and I think I've, I put it on our Instagram, but that's one thing he needs to figure out. Um, who is he? Where does he stand at this point? Is he against abuse or is he all about winning? Um, if you're all about winning, that's fine. You know, you can you can take the heat for, you know, promoting abuse um which I, he's not promoting abuse but that's how people look at it um if you're all about winning fine take it that way but if you're all about doing the right thing you gotta let him go you have to let him go even if there is nothing wrong and even if the reports are true um but it just it doesn't it hasn't looked good um since the follow-ups and everything that goes on with him so is he is he coming back i at the end of the day, I, I don't I don't think he will. I, don't, I think it's just too much against him at this point. Fair or not, um, does he play in the NFL again? I think it's another point of where Roger Goodell makes an example out of somebody. 
And is that fair? No. But I think he's going to make an example out of Tyreek Hill and uh, ban him outright. Because now it's talking not talking it's not, not just talking about women. It's talking about children. Right. Um, and I think that'll you know make Roger Goodell want to make an example out of Tyreek Hill if there's enough evidence to prove him guilty. More so than they're starting to look like now. Um, even though the fiance uh, aspect of it is very interesting. Yeah. See, well. that's my question because my thought process of it is especially after these texts that came out and if it's if it's all on her because you know the like the report said in the investigation the second time the police were called out Tyreek Hill wasn't even mentioned like he is not even a part of the re- police report mm-hmm. so i think to me personally it looks like she tried to throw him under the bus for some stuff that she did and then my question is if that's the case i mean I mean, how do you, how do you, do you judge it differently? Because personally, then I think if, you know, if, if it does, you know, what, whatever comes out here on forward, I think at this point, I mean, what, what has he done wrong? I, well, if he, if he didn't do anything wrong, he didn't do anything wrong. Um, but, you know, she has made claims that he's, you know, hit his son in the chest, uh, right. holding his arms out open wide, um, which, you know, is not okay. Right, and uh, and I means. do want to say that right. like the the child's well being is above all of this. Right. Like you know the the kid is number one, I, but at the end of the day, I mean, if it wasn't him that you know did it, I don't understand why he should get punished just because. I and the the conversation between the two, the tape does not sound good at all. At all. Yeah, and it and <clears throat> and especially with his his past history. Exactly. But. I still think at the end of the day, I mean, if he's, why should he be held accountable if it wasn't his doing in the first place, you know, and, and she tried to throw him under the bus to me. I mean, that's, I mean, why does he, why does he deserve to lose his job because of, well, I, I don't, I don't think they're there yet. Allegations. I don't think they're there yet. Right. Um, Right. And they're not. And I mean, clearly no one's making any decisions. The NFL, the Kansas City Chiefs. I don't think, has the NFL said anything? I don't think so. The only thing the Chiefs have said that he's suspended from all activity. Uh, he's still with the team and everything, and I don't think I don't think he's been placed on the exempt list or anything with the no, NFL. No, he's just yeah. he's not allowed to be involved with the Chiefs right. practice wise at any time right now. Yeah. So I I think it's a lot of just wait and see. Yeah. Um, with that situation, but I don't I, you know I don't know if you're looking at it as simply a Chiefs fan. I think they drafted well enough uh, to where that his replacement uh, Harmon is uh, a good replacement for him. He's basically the exact same player, except the only difference is is that uh, he played wide receiver his whole college career. Tyree Kill is right. more of a returner specialist. Um, so I think they drafted well in that regard, and I think that kind of maybe put the writing on the wall uh, if you're looking into cryptic you know, things of that nature. Uh, I think the Chiefs are kind of expecting this to go towards the way of getting rid of Tyreek. Well, I think that they made that, because that was before the text came out. And right. I think they made that move they may because have they known. knew. Yeah. They knew if nothing, if it, everything stayed the same, Tyreek was gone. You know, he he's a f- for sure out of the door. But I think with the text coming out and whatnot, I think that that does, you know, change things a little bit. And I think change things for them, and that's why he's been... You know, he's stuck around for as long as he has. But I think either way, the child needs to be removed from the home and, like, for good. Because I don't think that their relationship is uh, a good spot for a kid to grow up with. Or is at least what it seems outside looking in. Mm-hmm. Honestly, how I see the matter is the Chiefs are waiting till the final buzzer to make their decision. Ultimately, what you've seen with Kareem Hunt was a situation where a running back could be de- uh, replaced any time in the league. Get him off the team. We send him to the Browns or get picked up by the Browns and we can fill him in and our system can move along fine. But in the case of Tyreek Hill, it's hard to make an elite wide receiver. It's hard to come across a, an elite wide receiver such as someone like Tyreek. And I think you're just seeing that um, in this case. So they're waiting for any details that could come and prove his innocence. The way I personally see it is if he's not guilty of – uh, if they if they don't find evidence that finds him guilty of abuse of the child or anything of that matter, let him play. It's guys in the NFL doing far worse. And this is if Tyreek Hill is found innocent of uh, abuse of his 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 kid. 
But, I mean, there's guys in the NFL doing far worse and being allowed to play. So I don't understand why the Hunts have to take such a moral high ground in a dirty game. Does this remind you of the Adrian Peterson situation <clears throat> a little bit? I mean, I know it's a different position. Mm, yeah, no, I forgot but, about that, actually. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's... No, not really, because you're talking about a broken arm. Right. As opposed That's, to yeah. just getting your ass beat with a switch. Right. But, I mean, they, they carried it like it was worse, though. Well, and not to mention, he was suspended, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, he was suspended for it, and that was... What? He, he was gone for a whole season off of that, right? I don't think whole, I think he got hurt. Yeah, he was hurt. Yeah, I don't think it was the whole season, oh, okay. but I think that he missed at least four to six games and then got hurt. I thought it was in the double digits, like ten games. I don't. I think it's injury remember. exaggerated. Oh, okay. yeah, I think it was that he got hurt on top of it. But I mean, yeah, the NFL took a big stance on it. I mean, but this the, it is somewhat similar, but then you have to factor in the possible domestic violence right. with it too. You know what I'm saying? That's what kind of separates the Tyreek situation from the Adrian Peterson. It was just strictly parent on child violence as opposed to domestic violence as a whole. Like, you know, the encompassing uh, spectrum of it all. But at the same time, I mean, is that even... I haven't heard anything about that. Has that even been brought up? I mean, just due to the the voice recording that we heard between him and his fiance, yeah. he, he was making threatening statements. Like I, I think... I don't know. I mean, I agree with you. Cause, and I mean, if you go off his... Uh, past history i mean it's not and it's not like it's with a bunch of women it's mainly with this one girl Mm -hmm. um so i think that's you know that's strange too (laughs) give it up like it's yeah and and especially at this point like i mean what what is the point i mean nothing good is coming out of this i mean what is the point like to the to the point you're gonna lose your nfl career i mean because if that if that kid like if he broke his arm like i mean i kind of feel you he probably shouldn't be able to play again at all like somebody I, I another down ever right. yeah somebody i was with over at uh, a combine i was doing a couple weeks ago they brought up this good point you don't know how your kid's arm got broken because he he said he didn't know how it got broken in the recording and he said you don't know how your son's arm got broken if i knew how my son's arm got broken i would know instantly because you need to know. I mean, that's true, but also, what if he literally doesn't know because his fiance broke the kid's arm that's and true. they tried to hide it from him? Like, I'm pretty sure that's what the texts say. So, I mean, I don't know. At that situation, I think that that proves his innocence more than it does. I mean, what? Ray, you got that face on. Why? <laughs> because it, it just all sounds like BS to me. You know what yeah. I'm saying? You're an NFL player, though. Think about how much time that that takes. And that's true, but it's the off season. That's also true, but I mean, what if he's in the gym six hours a day working out, getting ready for the next so, season? You just came up this close to a Super Bowl, that close, right? So why not? Why not be working that hard for next year so you can make the Super Bowl and you can win a Super Bowl? I mean, I don't think that's out of the realm of possibility. He didn't ask his kid how his arm was broken? Like, th- does he just not talk to his son? Because that's what it sounds like. I mean, maybe a bad parent. Nobody I mean, said he was shit. a good father. Exactly. Right? <laughs> but like, yeah, hey, nobody. You know, no, I'm not. Like a high boss situation with the kid? What, you just I mean, feed the motherfucker? Like, what the? What? Maybe I not. mean, look at a lot of fucking dads out there. A lot of dads ain't even there for that kid in general. That's so, a fact, I mean, but like, the kid stays with him and his fiance. So, so he would have to have some type of interaction with this child, whether it's a high and by basis. And then if you see a kid with a broken arm, like you, that's something jarring. Like you can ask, like, "Hey, man, what happened?" What the kid gonna say? I don't know. Kids are brutally honest. But like, like Randy just said, I mean, we're not saying he's a good parent. I'm not Maybe he's not even on a high and by basis. Maybe he come in the house and go straight to bed. With I'm just saying. With the relationship that's been reported, he has with his fiance. It's safe to say that he might not be there all the time. It's safe to say yeah. he's probably not there a lot of the time. And when he does, when he does end up being there, fireworks happen. Like I said, I think that that, that plays into his hand more than it plays into. I, I I totally see what you're saying because you know if your kid's arm is broke, like how do you, how do you not know? You know what I mean? Like I get that, but at the same time, like we said, we not. We're we not necessarily sticking up for the dude what? saying he's a great parent. He's a role model citizen. I mean, he may not he may not even talk to his kids. Plus, I just thought about this, too. With a broken arm, you have to go get medical treatment. So mm-hmm. the fiancé would have had to take the child to an emergency room, doctor mm-hmm. visit, something of that. And then 
I'm not sure if they have insurance or not, but he would have been notified some way, like, hey, I need some money for this medical bill, or, hey, what's the insurance information? Like, we need to do this for the kid. But, I mean, what if not, though? What if what if he literally had no idea it, of... Or, I mean, it just sounds he, willfully he, ignorant. He That's probably... Which it may be. That's what we're saying. It may be because maybe he isn't around... 90% of the time. And we're basing everything off of this 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 uh recording like that's everything. Right. right. And it's right. not. We he probably knew what the jig was. He's probably like, "Ah, oh, he's trying to right. She's trying to record, exactly. she's trying to play me so I'm gonna just right." Cuz he he right. sounds right. mad right. irritated in know. that that clip. He sounds that's true. very annoyed and you know, who it's knows? Yeah. yeah, who knows how long the the conversation had already mm-hmm. been going on for. I mean, I don't know. There's a, there's just there is a lot of what ifs, and I think that when it comes down organizationally wise with the Chiefs, with so there being so many what ifs, I think they learn from the Kareem Hunt situation a little bit, and you know are waiting for all the what ifs to come out and did failed. they though? Because look I who mean, they I just so. traded for and signed. Who has you know? Is are you talking Frank about Clark. Uh, Frank Clark? Yeah. Who has a past like that too? I mean, but at the same time, I'm not talking about. I'm talking about the way they're handling this situation right now. That has not right. I think yeah. if just like with Kareem Hunt going to the Browns, this situation that happened has nothing to do with your organization. I mean, you're going to deal with the suspension, but you you signed who you signed, you knew who you signed, whatever. That, you know, past is past. Let let bygones be bygones, you know. I, I think it's kind of like the thought from another organization picking him up because Look, with the uh, Seattle, you know, that's that's the stain there, you know, like coming here like I think that once you move uh organizations it kinda helps kinda take the steam off a little no, bit. No, I agree. C- Seattle drafted him. And right. Seattle was the team that initially made that step. So I mean that's what I've agreed with from the beginning. But right. you know, if we're talking about taking the moral high ground mm. I mean, Hunt hasn't really taken the moral high ground like he thought, like he thinks he has. Yeah, and but why the fuck does that even matter? I mean, it it doesn't. It's a it's a job that you're doing and you're trying to get done. I don't give a fuck who's you know on my right. team as long as we're winning. And if you know Frank Clark helps him win a Super Bowl, I don't think anyone in Kansas City is gonna think about anything no, he's done in it, his past. No, it doesn't. But it does because they cut Kareem Hunt. Yeah, but I think that that goes back to that same situation of like it didn't happen here, so it didn't happen kind of thing. You know, just like Cleveland probably feels about... I mean, even though it happened in Cleveland. I was going to say, it happened in Cleveland, didn't it? Yeah, but still, you know, it didn't happen while he was with us, so whatever. So, for my segment, I have... Or for this segment, I have two little topics I want to bring up. I'm going to start with the Steve Harvey topic. Now, over, uh, I believe, last week on his show, Steve Harvey talked about how... The rich rich person or the rich people don't get eight hours of sleep. Right. You have to do certain things when you get up in the morning or whatever, what have you to contribute to your wealth. Um, And with that task in mind, you're not going to be able to sleep eight hours at night in there. uh, Naturally, with anything Steve Harvey says was a big uproar on Twitter. Uh, People just basically didn't agree with his take. So how do you guys feel about that? I know, Ray, you had a little disagreement. Yeah. Uh, and to kind of, you know, uh, go back to what Randy was saying, it kind of seems like people mainly like, you know, putting down Steve Harvey, even though this has been, this is a rhetoric, you know, uh, repeated by many different celebrities, right? I'm not sure why it's always Steve Harvey, but I'll say this, to tell people that they don't need eight hours of sleep or they shouldn't get eight hours of sleep, you know, to acquire more wealth, I feel like that's, it's inaccurate. You know what I'm saying? If he had told people to maximize their waking hours, fine, right? Nothing wrong with that. Because, yeah, we all have the same 24 hours, right? So those, you know, other 16 waking hours, maximize the shit out of them. Don't just, you know, get up out of bed and scroll on your phone for an hour and lollygag and whatnot. No, maximize your time, what you feel like you need to do to uh, progress forward and acquire more wealth. But that cutting out sleep, that, that just leads to an unhealthy life, which they'll be spending the money that they made trying to make up for that sleep that they lost because that leads to so many other health issues, in my humble opinion. Yeah, I agree with what you're saying about maximizing your waking hours because, you know, and everybody is different. So, I mean, you know, you 
you may not need as much sleep as I do, you know, to operate and whatnot uh, on a daily basis. So I think that it's kind of a thing where it's like you kind of you kind of do what your body tells you. You know what I mean? Like you you just have to, you know, growing as a person, you know, and becoming an adult. Like I think that you really, you know, you have to learn yourself and like what you know your boundaries are and whatnot, and know like you know say, just. Like you said, maximize your waking hours, exactly. you know? Because no, there's no exactly. one size fits all when it comes exactly. to sleep. Exactly, So, I mean, I I agree and disagree with kind of what he's saying because, you know, sometimes it does take a little less sleep to get that success that you want, you know what I mean? But, you know, sometimes you got to compromise. But at I'm, the end of the day, I, I agree with you that you just need to maximize your waking hours. And you do. Obviously, you do. But... What was the thing that got everybody so mad about what he said when he's basically talking about something that's been said for years? What was it about what Steve Harvey said that was so bad? It, it, it's a model of of wealth that everyone has, literally everyone has talked about. Countless and countless of gurus or what have you talk about, oh, you can't get eight hours of sleep. The days have already have gone. You got to get it. You know what I'm saying? Early right. bird. Early, early uh, bird against the, against the word. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I was like, Gary Vee has been spitting this rhetoric for, what, almost 10 years now? Like, you know, on our Facebooks and, you know, whatever social media you have. He's been spitting the same rhetoric for, you know, X amount of time. It's, I think it goes with a, a couple of things. One, just how reactive we are, especially like with Twitter and whatnot nowadays. And, you know, anybody says any little thing that... And it could just spark from like one person. Maybe one person had the opinion of, well, this is fucking stupid of, you know, Steve Harvey. And that just started a wildfire mm-hmm. and, you know, starts a, you know, it to trend or whatnot. It's all good, bro, yeah. because Lil, uh, Steve Harvey is really the Lil Bow Wow talk show host. Oh, big facts. Well, that's what I was going to say, uh, was that, that I think that uh, Steve Harvey, ever since that uh, the whole slip up with the card reading, yeah, yeah, Miss Universe stuff. dude, I think it's just made it easy, like, let's clown Steve Harvey. I think mm-hmm. that that's kind of almost like a, a thing, like, let him say anything, and we're we're going to attack it if we don't like it in the slightest, just because it's Steve Harvey, it's easy to go after him, I think it kind of affects Yeah, no, he's a very easy to chastise character. Yeah. So I think that it's both of those things of just being so reactive and then not to mention that Steve Harvey is kind of, you know, he's just, he's stayed kind of in the headlines with stuff like this that, mm-hmm. that people are just coming after him for. like. But, I mean, honestly, I don't think what he said was so wrong on the guidelines of look at how he moves in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you Steve Harvey has a radio show, he has a talk show or had a talk show. I think Ray said it's getting canceled or what have you. But he's a mover. Like, he's... He has all these yeah. things to do. I don't think that it's wrong think what you he can, said. I don't think you can get eight hours of sleep in his position. No. Same with like the Stephen A. Smiths of the world. Like you can't get eight hours of sleep doing what they do. So I think it was along the lines of like, all right, if you really want to go get it, if you really want to be a go getter in this industry or Hollywood or what have you, ain't no time for sleep for real. Like you got to really just go do what you got to do. Mm-hmm. If you haven't accomplished everything you needed to accomplish in the hours you've been allotted then you're going to have to stay up a couple extra hours mm-hmm. and go get it. Yeah. And that's what I think he was really trying to say. Mm-hmm. Um, but just moving forward, um, also there was fallout from Aisha Curry's, or Aisha Curry's latest statements on Red Table Talk with Jada Pinkett Smith. And she basically alluded to her husband, um, NBA All-Star, uh, Steph Curry, having groupies, or not having groupies, but groupies basically uh, wanting to be with Steph Curry and the attention that Steph Curry is getting from a lot of women. And she said uh, she expressed insecurities um, about her lack of interest and attention from men. And there was an uproar. People said, why do you need attention from other men? And your your husband just signed a $200 million contract, um, give you everything you ever wanted. He's a great man, yada, yada, yada. When the fuck did it become a crime to want to feel sexy as a person? Why is that an issue? I don't. I don't think it's an issue. I think it was just a, you know, a, a simple side comment that she made that was probably taken out of, you know, a, a completely different world. I can see where people get upset just because, you know, it's just oh, it's just some other lady that wants to be famous for a whole other reason other than her husband being so and so, whatever, so on and so forth. But I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't see the super big deal about it. I mean, if 
if she's happy with Steph and Steph, you know, makes her happy, and I mean, Steph's one of the top three best basketball players in the world right now. Yeah, nah, but go, go ahead. <laughs> no! <laughs> Who? Who? We're going to get into a yeah, whole yeah. other conversation. <laughs> go ahead, bro. Whatever. <laughs> But to to finish the point, yeah, I don't I don't see that big of a deal in it. I mean, if that's how she feels, that's how she feels. I mean, if she if some people just like more attention than others. I mean, if that's if that's what she wants, then that's fine. I don't think she was saying you know any disloyalties towards Steph Curry. I don't think it was anything of like that. She's just saying like he gets all this attention. That'd be nice if I got some because I mean you know she is known too. I mean so I don't I don't I don't see the big deal. I'll say it's a bit contradictory on her part because you you want that quote-unquote sexy attention but she dresses very conservative not much skin is showing and oh what <laughs> what is you to, sexist pig yeah, why, did, but why <laughs> does she so she has to dress i'm not saying she has to dress like sexy. a complete whore but this is what i'm trying to get oh, to the point my god rage right. went down a rabbit hole yep no i'm not i'm, I'm <laughs> to get to the point this is the same woman who was essentially slut shaming like three four years ago who was she slut slaming she, she was saying like if y'all would get off of like the internet and like you know care to more towards your man y'all would have a man this is literally what she said that's not slut shaming that's saying get your shit right Bro. Why is that so slamming? Because, bro, she's sitting there saying, like, don't be sitting there posting, like, half-ass pics and whatnot. Focus more on that man. Right? All right, bro. In this day and age, that's slut shaming, dog. Like that's not slut shaming. In this day and age, that is, bro. From, anytime from you tell people to put clothes on, that's what happens. If you eat something, what? And you're telling people to put some clothes on. That's slut shaming. That's not slut shaming. Yeah, that's not slut shaming. She was saying, right. no, 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 no. She was saying, if you're gonna do all that, just pay attention to your man too. As much energy as you're putting into that, put some energy into your man. And maybe things will turn out better. That's not slut shaming. That's saying be a fucking better on point girlfriend or wife or whatever. That's how they take it, bro. I'm just saying. I I, I, I know the difference. They don't. The general public acts like they don't. So so what was so wrong with I don't see what what was so wrong with she said. I'm just saying So is it wrong for her to want to feel sexy and get attention from other men not necessarily because i think people think that she just wants to fuck other dudes no I, and that's not my thought process in the slightest i know she's she's secure within her relationship she does want to feel sexy well if that's the case you gotta be sexy because this is the worst part she's not an ugly woman right. it's the alicia keys effect to me because alicia keys is very fine but has little sex appeal Alicia Keys is sexy, dog, and I don't want to hear it. Stop it. <laughs> Alicia Keys is Stop. sexy. She doesn't have sex appeal. Bro. Alicia Keys is sexy. <laughs> you can say that until you blew in the face. She does not have sex appeal. Why? Why don't Alicia Keys... She just does. She I agree with it. you. I agree with you. Aisha Curry don't have sex appeal. She does. I agree with you on that. Because, like, okay... Look. Alicia Keys, though, dog? She does not have sex appeal. Man. She does not have sex appeal. She is She don't fine. have to say... She, she all she got to do is play a piano. I'm thinking Alicia Keys sexy as fuck. <laughs> Play that piano, baby. See well, okay, but my question is, so you, you got to be posting... I'm not saying that, but you do have to dress a bit more provocative. She wears, like, full-on, like... I don't think she has to dress... Why you got to dress provocative? I don't think she has to dress provocative. I, I think she just has to have, like... Accentuate some the features. People, not even that. I think she just has to ooze sexiness from her fucking being. And this is the whole that, thing. That doesn't have to deal with clothes. I think it's just your aura. And I, I know women with a sexy aura that can have... Fucking have one of them medieval ass dresses on and still be sexy as hell. Okay, yeah, because like Tiana Taylor is like one of my favorite examples, right? She just oozes sex appeal. Not even the prettiest woman ever, but just oozes sex appeal. She can have anything on. She like she basically dresses like she's androgynous. She'll dress like a man one day and then like a female one day in, in those traditional ways, right? And still oozes sex appeal. That's what I'm saying. It helps accentuate it. And she doesn't naturally have sex appeal. So that's what I'm saying. The clothes will help accentuate But then does that go back to the, you know, the uh, one in attention? Because she's uh, feeling, you know, what's the, what's the words? I'm insecure? Thinking? Insecure, thank you. And that's part of why she's not oozing the sex appeal, like, which is what you're talking about. I mean, Ayesha Curry, she's relatively young, right? I mean, she's... Like 28, um, maybe? Yeah, so, I mean, she has three kids with Steph, I believe. I She's just not... I think she just has that mom blues where it's just like, oh, yeah, the best years of my life are kind of maybe heading down the drain or what have you. And what have I really done? Why isn't nobody finding me attractive? Blah, blah, blah. You know what I'm saying? I think it's more of mm -hmm. that than anything. 
No, bro, because I just had like a random thought come through my head when uh, who was that? Mark Jackson was talking about Steph Sutton. <laughs> <laughs> he knocked that out the park <laughs> and completely ignored Aisha. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, because you talking about LeBron White. That's who he's talking about. I think about? he was talking about Savannah. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Dude, what do you say, bro? He like, said, I would knock that out the park. She's all state. <laughs> <laughs> and I would knock that out the park. The fact that he said that shit like a pastor, dog. Like a pastor on live television. Damn. Yeah. And he's seen that. Because <laughs> what, that was like in the 2016 finals? I don't even remember when he said that shit. Low-key, I think he was referring to like pitching, though. Like, I don't think he was really talking about knocking... Uh, <laughs> but you never know what Pat like. Yeah, bro. You never know what Mark Jackson. But, but just to get back on topic, man, I don't think it's anything wrong with the woman wanting to, especially women. I think everybody wants to feel sexy and feel like you know even even niggas want to go go past the club or go past the woman and get their looks. I'm not gonna say anything. I'm not gonna say anything about a certain co-host we have in the room right now <laughs> that may get in trouble about certain comments I may relay. So I'm gonna just say like, but uh, EDJ, I, I'm not. I, I don't want to get in trouble. Get in trouble too. Yeah, I, the views of the, Randy and myself do not <laughs> not <laughs> EDJ get in trouble. But every like everybody wants to feel like they're attractive. Everybody wants that attention, especially women. They want that valid validated. They want it their aesthetics validated. And I don't think there's a problem with that. No, and it's not an issue. But like that's the main thing I'm saying. Like so, if she just wants to feel sexy, then be sexy. Like just go get sexy for yourself, not even for anybody else. And then it'll come naturally at that point. Just go get sexy for yourself. Whatever you define as sexy, do that. Be that. Because then it'll come. You'll get the, you know, the look so whatever that you're looking for. It will come. But you have to do it first. That's a, a great point because at the end of the day, that shit comes within yourself. Within. It comes from you don't within. You don't need to go find attention from other people to make yourself, you know, it's like Cat Williams said. It's self-esteem. <laughs> that comes from you yourself. You gotta be a whole star motherfucking player. <laughs> But for real though, at the end of the day, that comes with yourself, you know. And I think, like what you say, you gotta you gotta find what that means to you, and and be that. Exactly. That's all I'm trying to get across. But just to close this out, I got a little poem for Aisha. Don't feel insecure, baby. I got you. <clears throat> My D roses are red. I wanted your husband's team to lose. Don't feel insecure, Aisha. I see the sexiness in you. That's a wrap. Boom! <laughs> Get him off the stage! <laughs> Thank you for tuning in to the Showbang Show. We appreciate all the support, uh, especially coming off the last episode. Y'all really showed up and showed out. I just want to say thank you from everybody here, from my man Papa Schroeder, to my man Rated R, Randy, to my man EDJ, and to my man B on the couch, you know what I mean? <laughs> Who still ain't got a mic. All right. So from us and ours to you and yours, y'all have a great evening. Trubbanks out. <laughs> you feel me?